Hey everyone, welcome to another session of Manufacturing Live. As you can see, the background looks a little bit different. That's because we're getting ready for everything 3D experience world. The two machines behind me, you'll actually get to see in about uh, 60 days out in February. But the reason that we're having this conversation today is for our good friends and amazing car builders, Factory 5. So today we have Dave, the owner of Factory 5 on. And Dave, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, not much interesting to talk about. Uh, we run a cool company, though. Um, you know, my background was uh, undergraduate University of Wisconsin. I worked at View Medical School and got involved in CAD with the early days of AutoCAD and uh, started this company. And so if someone's going to build their own sports car, they're going to build a Factory 5. And it's kind of a, a company where we, we mix classic looks with really high technology underneath. So, you know, SolidWorks has been you know, our underpinnings for the longest time. So all of our chassis and designs use SolidWorks. And, you know, we build projects that, that other people build, you know, use to build their cars. And you're talking about projects. You guys have a, a pretty cool one that's coming out here pretty soon. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because it's actually going to be in the shop floor at 3D Experience World. Right. So, I mean, if you're thinking about Factory 5, most people know our company as uh, build-it-yourself Cobra kit cars. You know, and the Cobra is kind of the most famous of all the, the replicas out there. Um, we don't build finished cars, though. We're, we're designing the parts that people use to build their own cars. So the full tube steel chassis, and we, we can get into the CNC and, and how we make them um, in a little bit. It's really fun. But if you run your own car company and you have a chance to make replicas, that's great. But at some point, there's a little bit of hubris that comes in. And you say, hey, you want to make your own car. Um, so... We decided to design our own supercar um, using your guys' great software. We decided to, to you know, do something outrageous. And so we're bringing the car. It's the world debut. And so no one has seen the car. A little bit of release is online. But it's a, a front engine, V12, 9.5 liter, 850 horsepower. You know, conventional, it's not a, a, ba a battery electric vehicle. But it's an outrageous supercar, all carbon fiber body, your uh, tube steel chassis, suspension, everything done on SolidWorks. The, the car will debut at SolidWorks World, and uh, we'll show it off. I think it's really impressive. The guy who designed it is Phil Franks, who designed it with our engineers, and Phil designed the original Celine S7. So if you're a car guy, the Celine S7 back in about 2000 was a supercar. Well, this is Phil and our greatest cut on this. So it's our own design. It, and I must say from the pictures, I cannot wait to see it in person. Now, when you talk about the manufacturing, you talk, talk about some of the components. Can you sort of explain a little bit about that? Because I, there's a, a lot of times a misconception about um, cars, right, and how they're built and the quality that comes into them sometimes. So can you talk a little bit about your process and, and how you're, you're using automation to ensure quality and, and make everything great? It really goes back to when the company started. And, you know, Factory 5 was entering a custom car industry, right, when my brother and I started the company. And, and it was my kind of contention that if we don't start with CAD right up front, right, and, and bake it into everything we do, that we're just going to be an also-ran company. And so the big difference between our company and all of our competitors from 27 years ago till, till, till today is we were using CAD. We were using uh, DXF file, flat file, laser cutting on all our plate steel right off the bat in 95. And I remember our competitors were looking at us saying, you know, my God, why are you doing laser cutting? At the time, the technology was really aerospace, biotech, kind of biomedical. A lot of the high-end companies were using it, right? Um, yep. Go to Walmart and buy a flat screen TV. When this came out, they were 10 grand. So when we started Factory 5, the essential flat screen TV was 10 grand. Laser cutting was prohibitively expensive. But we kind of figured that as time went by, it would become commoditized, and it did. And CAD has really filtered down, especially CAM. On, on the manufacturing side, not just tube steel laser, not flat steel laser, but tube steel laser, uh, CNC milling. We've got a six axis milling machine here. All of that was baked in up front. So people think of Factory 5 as a hobbyist, as a kit car company, but, but underneath everything was day one commitment to CAD in, in tooling, um, in the parts. You know, there's so much fun stuff that you can talk about in parts. When you laser cut a steel part, um, Let's say my competitor is using a plasma cutter by hand, right? Um, yep. I, can, I can put the instructions in the part. You know, I can put the bending yep. instructions in the part. The part is the drawing. So from a validation standpoint, forget all your quality control checks, your box dimensions, your drawings that nobody looks at. They become wallpaper after time. 
validate your computer, your, your files, validate your revisions, and make sure that, that when you're manufacturing, those parts become the drawing. They become the instructions that they carry with them. They become kind of uh, uh, part of the fixtures as well because with that early days, we were able to put notches and tabs and holes that would center parts in, in, the, in the welding jig. So now the part is part of the fixture and the welding jig in addition to the parts. So if we didn't do that up front back in the day, we would never have been the industry leader we are today. And we are so much more sophisticated today, but it's just – it's degrees uh, of function difference. We started with CAD. And it was humble beginnings, but without that, we, we it was it was the the linchpin to everything. Yeah. Hey, in talking lasers, that's near and dear to my heart. I started my first CNC was running Trump lasers, so I I love tabbing, tabbing and notching and engraving and etching and all that good stuff. And when SolidWorks came out with the tab command, I was telling some of our developers, I was like, I made a lot of money over the last twenty years teaching people how to tab and notch, and you now just put it in a button so everybody can do it. Um, so I, you know, you talk about that stuff, it is very near and dear to, to what I believe for automation. Now, when you talk about factory five, like how big of a company is it? Is it 300 million, a million people? Like what is the size of factory five? Maybe someday. Um, yeah, we do about, uh, between 15 and $20 million a year in sales. We build 500 cars a year. So that's 10 cars a week, like clockwork. And, and when I say cars, we're really building the the kit that a guy is going to build but if you look at it it looks like a car it's a car in a box essentially so um we've got 42 employees full-time we've been in business for 27 years we've got an aggregate of about 60,000 square foot in manufacturing space uh cad dedicated about 12,000 square foot to cad operations that underlie welding and molding and composites and chassis assembly so um it's it's a build-it-yourself car company it's really an engineering and parts company um I'm lucky to run the company, but, you know, literally five years after we started, you know, CAD just ran away from me. My brother and I used to have competitions with nesting on a, on a laser, right? How many parts can you nest and where can you configure them? It's all automated now. And I'm, you know, yeah. Jesper looks at me like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm using a wagon wheel. But, uh, yeah, so CAD has evolved. But that substrate underneath what we're doing has enabled us to really lead the industry in terms of, remember, we're making a custom car, right? That means a car that is going to be different. Every single person who builds it is going to build it a little differently. And we've, we have to make it customizable. But on the other side, it is the most controlled. Variability is my enemy. So I'm making a custom car that has got a ton of features and, 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 and options and ways to build it. But I don't want to do it different. I want to do it the same every time. Every chassis, every pickup point, everything has to be perfect. Uh, you lose sleep thinking about all the variability, but without yeah. that that lever of CAD, it's it's really untenable. We'd have to charge three, four times the price. And our charter is to put a car in the hands of every guy who has the skills to build it, not necessarily the money to build it. So we have a real value engineering proposition. We've got to engineer a build it yourself car that's worth a hundred grand, but we have to be able to sell it for twenty thousand dollars and have margin yeah. in that. So CAD is yeah. A, yeah. Yeah. Well, and it is interesting when you think about it because, you know, the hot rod aftermarket world is all about customizing, right? I don't want what the next person has. Um, so having all the configurability, but still maintaining a uniform platform that I can go drop any small block in and it's going to fit like that. There's a lot of challenges in that because, it's you a know, total oxymoron. It, yeah. It's, yeah. It's like make it, each one has to be unique and distinct because if it's cookie cutter, nobody wants it. A hot rodder yep. wants a custom one-of-a-kind car, yep. and we have to do that, and we have no variability. We have no, we have no patience for anything. So our, our standard frames have to be very flexible, but they have to be made perfect every time. Yeah. Yeah, so through that, you know, you were talking about picturing and things like that before. Like, um, I would imagine a big portion of your design revolves around how to make that fixture to be able to assemble it quickly, efficiently, without any overhead, but still have that repeatability. So I, I'm guessing, and maybe you can elaborate a little bit more about how you're going through the fixture design process, because it seems like that's a big key. Well, there is, and, and <clears throat> excuse me, we are going to be at SolidWorks where we're gonna be showing some of the parts and some robotic welding. We've done robotic welding here. Um, but when you're talking about fixturing, you're talking about individual parts, like a control arm for a car, uh, a sway bar, a suspension uh, part, uh, we're also talking about the chassis itself. So if we, if we were to start with the biggest 
uh, assembly, the chassis, and you're talking about a chassis that's 14 feet long, it weighs maybe 400 pounds, it's made of maybe 800 pieces of tube steel welded together. You know, the way cars are made today, um, they, you, you know, the big three couldn't afford to build a car the way we build them. Um, we're building them with tube steel and making kind of like a classic race car in the 60s and 50s. Um, actually, very similar to a modern truck today where you have a platform frame and then you have a, a cab that gets bolted to it. You know, our body is bolted to uh, the tube steel frame. So from the fixturing standpoint, welding is a little bit still of a black art. You know, materials expand and contract at different rates depending on where you're welding and what angles you're welding, what penetration, what types of steel. But, you know, SolidWorks can give us the cut lists. We can do the build materials off SolidWorks. We can build the frame. But in addition to the tube steel chassis, this is a space frame, right? In addition to that, we're building the fixture that, that holds it in the welding operations. And, and if you think about making a car frame in a welding operation, you're making the fixture that holds the pieces of steel that get dropped in. And tolerance critical pieces have to be in the right spot. Then they're welded. And then you really can't get to all the little nooks and crannies in the fixture, right? So you take it out of the fixture and you put it in a rotisserie to finish it off. So hopefully you do most of your bulk welding in the fixture. But where CAD swooped in and 27 years ago, I never anticipated this, was the part is the fixture. So if you can take a part of the chassis and tab it and make it so it's going to align with a right angle or a cut to another piece, the pieces actually become the fixture themselves and you need less fixture. And where welding is a black art, you're reducing the, you know, the magic of it and increasing the science of it. And so our R&R, &R, our re reproducibility and reliability of our chassis is off the charts compared to a handmade chassis. But um, yeah, those fixtures, we're doing fixtures on SOLIDWORKS. We're doing the parts on SOLIDWORKS. We're doing the whole thing. I mean, from soup to nuts. Yeah, yeah we, you've been kind enough to share the, the new supercar with us so we can machine some parts back there. And it, it's a pretty cool assembly um, of, of how you guys are building all that. And you, you talked a little bit about the lasers. You guys have some tube lasers in-house too to allow you to do that additional tabbing and, and notching and things like that too, right? Oh yeah, before the tube steel laser brought in, the amount of milling we were doing, manual milling, and, and these are sometimes really, really acute angles and, and, and sections where a piece of round tubing intersects with a piece of square tubing. And the intersection, you bring them together on solder, which is great, but try milling that by hand. It's virtually impossible. Yeah. So um, when I was looking at um, bringing the tube steel laser, we were looking at vertically integrating more of the company. So we were already doing, you know, flat laser cutting um, plate steel. We're already doing aluminum stainless. We're already doing trimming operations in the, in the composite building with a six axis milling machine, but we hadn't brought in the tube steel yet. And Jim in engineering, uh, Rensselaer Polytech smart guy, he'll be down at SolidWorks World. Um, he was like, you know, the reason for the laser, for the tube steel laser, wasn't just cost reduction and vertical integration. That was a good reason. And that was reason enough to do it. He goes, the real reason is process. I can design and design better with this tube steel laser because the way it has a mandrel drive and it has a laser head that's flexible. So you can put fish mouth cuts, you can put weird, strange cuts, angle cuts, uh, 90 degree cuts. You can put slotting yeah. and tabbing. So yeah, when we brought that laser in, it was about a year ago, uh, right around this time it was delivered. It's a uh, um, it's an LVD TL machine. It's running um, about a 24 foot magazine. So you put a oh, wow. 24 foot long piece of tubing in it and it feeds in and yeah. cuts it. But yeah, the tube seal layers were the last component of CAD that we've added where we had the milling machines and the CNC bending press with the Cincinnati and the plate steel Mitsubishi. But yeah, this is the last one and it really made all the difference. Okay. So it, it sounds like. Um, and I've, I've seen lots of great companies <laughs> do this. You see SolidWorks and CAD more as a tool to enable the manufacturing versus just solely a design tool that sits over here in the corner and I create a couple parts and that's great, it goes downstream. Like you're actually changing how you design some of your process based on the capability that you have in the shop. Oh yeah, I don't think we could have done the supercar. No, we, sh we could not have done the supercar because we even used um, surfacing on making the, the molds and the plugs um, these are all carbon fiber parts, and so they have to be perfect. They're down to, you know, yeah. thousands of an inch. But, uh, yeah, the tube seal laser bring in and CAD was basically designing a car is a, is a multi-hundred million dollar operation. And for a small company of ours to do it, you know, this software and, and hardware applications that we have today are enabling that to be done. 
you know, you really couldn't do this by hand and you couldn't do this 25 years ago. Uh, you, you certainly couldn't scale up. Um, so yeah, CAD central, everything we're doing. And had we not baked it in, I have such a great story. I was, I asked one of the engineers one time to cut me a, uh, just sure cut me a piece of aluminum. Uh, my Ducati shift lever was broken and I needed a piece of aluminum, maybe three inches by a quarter of an inch or three quarters of an inch rather with a hole drilled in it. And he drew it and cut it on a million dollar laser cutting machine. You know, it's the, the carriage is eight by 12 and it's cutting a piece this big. He can't think that just go in the shop and sure cut it and drill press it. We think yeah. automation on everything and, and that made all the difference. Yeah. 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 That, I mean, it is funny how your mind changes, right? You, if you grew up doing it the hand way, it takes a while to get to use the automation. But if you've only ever known automation, you don't even think anything else besides that. Yeah, it's a different eon. So, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, I do want to remind everyone, if you have questions for Dave or anything through the conversation, please go ahead and reach out. This is a live segment. We want to make sure we get any questions in from anybody. Um, my next question is, so you've done a lot of stuff over the last 20 years. you put in a lot of automation. Where do you think the future is in what we're doing? Because you mentioned electric cars earlier. You know, we... We have like EV West, which is a partner, Blueprint Engines, which does the traditional combustion engines. Like, where do you see Factory 5 going in the future? See, we're kind of the hobbyists. So we're lucky that we're probably the last great hope for the internal combustion engine. <laughs> you know, um, if you look at the horse, you know, it, at the turn of the century, horses were all over Manhattan. And now they're on specific horse parks and farms. And uh, I suppose the, the internal combustion engine and race cars will be in 50 or 100 years constrained to race tracks and specialty events and, and parades and cruisins and stuff like that. But um, where I think it's going, and we worked with EV West, we did a, an EV power plant for one of our 818s, which is one of our modern designs. It's our own design. Um, okay. It was originally Subaru powered. We did an EV West power plant, worked out great. Um, we obviously used CAD to pick up points on the engine and transmission, or at least the, the motor drive. Um, but Factory Five is kind of a, a hobbyist company. So we're going to be you know, the last bastion of classic motorsports. Um, however, if you look at the, the habit of the company of integrating the latest technology, you know, we like the classic designs and the shape and the look and the feel. But right now, we're a corporate partner with Ford. We've worked with you guys. Um, you know, Ford will give us their latest and greatest engines to put in our cars. Um, you know, we're kind of the Christmas tree that you can hang a lot of ornaments on. But where I see the auto industry going is very different than where I see Factory 5 going because we're such a niche part of the business. So we're kind of going to always be in that high-performance internal combustion engine. But I think that our customers and our desires to always integrate newest technology. So right now we're working on an electric Cobra. We've done an electric and a battery electric GTM, our mid-engine car. Uh, I think we won a breakthrough award in 2012 or 2013 with Popular Mechanics. We, and it was a an electric hybrid. We had a, 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 a actually a Volkswagen. Remember the TDI engine? It won yep. Green Engine of the Year in 2012, but it wasn't quite. Well, we all thought yeah. it was. Yeah. So we did a, a hybrid with that drive and a, and a battery electric. So, you know, I think that our customers are driving a lot of this. As long as we provide the substrate parts that a guy can use to design or build his or her own car, um, those guys are pretty creative and. Most of the customers that have built our cars have built better cars than maybe we could do ourselves. And innovation comes from grassroots levels. I mean, one of the reasons why we're doing what we're doing is because we're enabling a guy at home to kind of put his own ideas into the vehicle. So I guess we're either at the tip of the spear or at the end of the tail of donkey, you know, but we're at, at definitely at, at the ends of the spectrums when it comes to technology and customization and, and classic cars. So it's kind of a I don't know. I, I think in the in the bigger picture where the car industry is going is a lot different because that's the transportation industry. And we're really not in that. We're in the in the fun and recreation department. We're building more of a Harley Davidson than we are a, a minivan. True. Well, and, you know, for us old SolidWorks people, I mean, we remember the 32 electric roadster that was at SolidWorks World that's right. in like, what, 2010? Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, Factory 5 was technically ahead of everybody else at that point by having, you know, that car there. So, um, it, it, it's interesting to me cause I've been following a bunch of, a bunch of different, you know, hot rod builders and things like that, trying to put Tesla parts and stuff. And, um, you know, ultimately they always end up using SolidWorks for some component of it. So I, I was just always curious because I see like Ford just came out with their, you know, electric drive motors for 3,900 bucks and they've already sold out of all of them. And I'm like, you know, that, that componentization of electric is just prime for 
you know, a car like a Factory 5 Cobra or something like that. So it, it's always, it piques my interest to see what other people are doing. So, But if you, if you think about hot rodders from World War II, they came back from World War II and they wanted to get a, they wanted to get married, have a little house and soup up an old flathead Ford, right? Innovation yep. has always come from the hot rod industry. So it's not a surprise that, you know, we did a battery electric hot rod when no one would. That was with A123 Systems batteries and your software. That was a, a cool car. I think the controller on it was a little sketchy, and they've come a long way now, but it was like an on-off throttle. We took it to the track, and yeah. it was fast as hell, but scary. Yeah, so I think innovation and the hot rod industry are kind of walk hand in hand. Almost a lot of the innovations on, on ICE engines came from supercharging, customization, and racing. Um, I don't think that's going to change, and I think you're going to see more of the same. Yeah, I, to me, I, you know, some of the hot rodders are sort of negative about the change on that, but I, I, to me, I think it's sort of cool. Um, you know, there's just another there's way to go fast. Run. Yeah, that, that's right. Like the instant acceleration. I'm like, hey, yeah, hey, sign me up. You know, I'm for that. So, um, so as we look at, we've talked a little bit about a couple different cars. We look at the, the body and all that stuff. I mean, you guys are, you guys manufacture the body components too. We've talked about the chassis, but like the body component is a very unique thing that you at factory five do as well. Right. Right. I mean, we're doing all the molding. So uh, composites and, 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 and actually this is a good plug for SOLIDWORKS because the way we design our cars, the chassis is carrying the load. So the chassis is carrying the load of the suspension. Um, you know, one of our hallmarks at Factory 5 is we're known for our chassis work. Um, composites are along for the ride. So if you think of our the way we use fiberglass, the stereotypical kit car world used, you know, back in the, in the late 60s or early 70s, you know, we discovered fiberglass, so you can make all these cool shapes. But they started using it to do work. And today's composites, in terms of carbon fiber and some of the, the stress-bearing structural members that are made out of carbon, are great. Um, we don't really use composites for their most advanced application. We're using them for what they really, when they were originally innovated, what they were good for, which is making a cool shape, but not doing a lot of work. So the fiberglass is along for the ride. So we're basically designing our own plugs. Uh, we're using surfacing. Uh, we use Symmetrics, good partner to, to SolidWorks uh, out of Bristol, Rhode Island. And Symmetrics will take our CAD and they'll make a plug for us. And they'll typically mill away about maybe uh, maybe a sixteenth of an inch more material than you would normally want to. And then put a hardener okay. over the foam and then mill that to the correct spec. And there is a handmade plug that would take three months done in literally three hours. And so... That's the plug. Those are the substrate shapes that we use to make, like, our doors, our door liner, our hoods, hood liners, fenders, you know, main body shells. That's all done with CAD. Um, the finishing is still done by hand, and we're still doing hand layup. So if you, if you look at the way we're doing composites, and I really should walk around with a computer because it's pretty fascinating. We have some stuff on our website, but we have a sandwich of technology. We have, like, high-tech in the upfront section of composites, so the making of the molds the CAD, the designing, and the fitment, and the tolerances of the molds, the plugs. And then the actual manufacturing of the part is hand layup. We're CNC cutting. We have an LVH. Uh, no, we don't. We have a, an Eastman M900 CNC cutter, DXF file, flat file, that cuts our fabric. So we, we cut the CNC fabric. We drop it into a mold. We do a wet layup, which is old-fashioned. And then we take that part that has rough edges, the, the composite part, and we drop yeah. it into a a brand new six axis milling machine robot. And the milling machine then trims the edges and makes it close enough for the guy who's going to build his or her own car, you know, to kind of put on the body, do a little body work and, and paint it. Okay. But so our composite process is CAD up front, CAD even in the cutting of the material, hand layup, old fashioned way, um, when gel coating, and then finishing it off with milling. Um, the customer does the finished operations of painting. We don't do that. But, um, yeah, so from the composite standpoint, we're using materials the way they're supposed to be used um, to carry their own shape, uh, not to do a lot of work. And we're, we're using CAD in about two-thirds of the process. And I don't think we're going to get away from the hand layup process. It's really um, at our volume of about 500, maybe, you know, each car has eight or ten panels. So that's maybe 5,000 panels we're making a year. The hand-laid fiberglass process is still probably the most optimized. We looked at resin infusion we've looked at uh, thermoplastic forming um, and other parts but really where our volume is hand laid fiberglass works we just have the cad component on each side to make it better that makes sense yeah definitely from a volume perspective so 
if someone buys a car from factory five, what's the process? What does it look like? You know, is, you, you, is it like the old military Jeep? It shows up in a crate and everything's paneled to the walls or like, <coughs> yeah, what, sort what does of. that look like? It's, it's, it's car in a box, but you know, this, this COVID period, um, and, and I, I want to bring this in because it was one of those things that when you're running a company, you really need to guess right. You know, they're paying me to make sure that I'm right two years from now. And two years ago, I had already pulled the trigger on about three and a half million dollars worth of CNC tooling and investment to vertically integrate some of our operations. And then came COVID. And I literally, when we were shut down for two weeks in March of 2020, um, it turned out that, that part of our operations were essential services. We were able to come back sooner than most companies. But I had pulled the trigger on this big investment, anticipating volume, and when COVID came out, I figured, we're out of business. We're done. Our business is going to contract by 50%, just the opposite. Everybody in the world is sitting at home, and, they, and, and the phone calls we got was one call after the next after the next, multiplied by a 1,000 times. You know, I always wanted to build my own car, and now I'm at working from home. So we like uh, home builders, um, like you know, exercise equipment, um, maybe bicycles sold out. So the car in a box, when someone orders from factory five right now, our volumes are fairly constant. It's hard for us to get parts. Um, if you called Mike and said, Hey, I want to build a factory five. You could have one in September of next year, September, you know, we're completely sold out. So yeah, yeah. it's, 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 it's a challenge, but at the same time, what you're getting is that old Willie's Jeep in a box or a Lotus super seven in a box. It's a, it's the frame, it's the body. It's the aluminum panels that are laser cut that make up the cockpit and the trunk and the foot boxes. And then there's maybe 4,000 parts, you know, your brake lines and your suspension, your shocks, all your gauges. If you touch a part on a car, we include it in the kit. What we don't include are the running gear. So the engine transmission rear end. And that gives a customer a lot of abilities to customize drivetrain. And then they can paint any color they want. We've got a ton of options to build your car your way. That's very cool. Yeah, engine options always get a little, a little weird, right? Because you're either a Ford guy or a Chevy guy or a Dodge guy, Huge. and like you know, Huge. it's a, a, a of lifetime. Loyalty. Yeah, th that argument will go on forever. Um, yeah. Which one's best? And you know, Ford nine inch is probably the better rear end for most people. But you know, again, if you're a Chevy guy, that sort of you know gets people in trouble. So, um, but it, it, to me, it seems cool because like um, I build cars on the side uh, for people. And it's amazing how many times a car will show up and they'll be like, oh, yeah, I got all the parts for you. All you got to do is put it together. And yeah, right. fi 50 trips to the parts store later in Amazon and Speedway and everybody else, I finally have all the parts I need. So for them to just be in a box would be super cool because um, you waste well, a lot of time. Well, what you're talking about fitment, though, is – and the problem is multiplied in a cottage industry. So you know, if you were saying – taking parts from Ford and GM and Chrysler and combining them, that would be one thing. Um, these are huge, large scale manufacturers with great quality control and tolerance control. You're talking about a cottage industry. So you go to Speedway and you buy a, a grill for a 33 and then you're going to put that on, on someone else's body and someone else's chassis. And without CAD in the cottage industry, it is a fright pig of tolerances don't fit, parts don't fit cobbling away, hammering, cutting, grinding, deburring. So for us, having all the parts in a box that come from us and having that process really, the underpinnings of the whole process are CAD, what happens is, and it's not always perfect, but what happens is the fitment and the assembly of the, of the build-it-yourself car is so much more fun than having things that don't line up and don't fit. And that, every car guy knows. You go to Napa and you pick up an alternator, you come home with a four belt pulley, not a five belt pulley, you got to go back and then they're closed. So we want to try to reduce the number of trips to the auto parts store that our customers take. But yeah, um, in a cottage industry, that, that problem is even magnified because you got a lot more variability in small handwork parts. So we've kind of killed that. And that, that history of the kit car industry of things that don't fit and things that really weren't well engineered. Um, I, you know, I take a lot of responsibility for you know, revolutionizing the kit car industry and bring it into an industry that is something that a lot of people can do and not just a few talented fabricators, you know, that fix yeah. mistakes. Well, yeah, I mean, if you, if you want it so anyone with an average skill set can build a car, it can't be one of those deals where you have to have $35,000 of special equipment to make that one part fit. Like, it has to be true bolt-together fitting. Yeah, and that's where CAD, CAD changed everything because that... 
the number of people, the the total available market exploded when it was a little bit easier to build. And you weren't, you know, try restoring an old XKE Jaguar, monocoque body, corrosion, fasteners, British parts. You're going to yeah. be chasing parts. You're going to be fabricating stuff. It's that's a skill set that's that's really constrained to a small number of people. Whereas building a car from that's well engineered from all new parts is actually safer. It's easier. It's more fun. Um, my son Adam is 18 years old. Uh, he's 20 now. For his senior project in high school, he built a factory five, and um, and he's not a mechanic. So him and I were were kind of at odds for a few things, like yeah. a lot of 18 year olds are with their with their dads. And uh, when we were done building the car, he was amazed at how much I had learned. So, yeah. <laughs> so it usually goes, right? I yeah, mean, yeah. at that age, everyone else has to learn, not me. <laughs> but it opened up the market to guys that weren't necessarily yeah. car fabricators, and it made it to car yeah. assemblers. And that, that, that's been one of the you know, keys to our success. So that wouldn't have happened without CAD. All these blessings happened up front with that commitment, you know, um, Bob Tasca senior wrote a book and one of his ideas was bet on the come, put yourself in a position where the technology or your own creativity has to find your way out of the problem. And by, by marrying our company with CAD up front, you know, the costs were huge. We had to bank on that becoming commoditized and it did. And so we were lucky, but yeah, without it, none of this would have happened. Yeah, it, it's amazing how some of those tools in the early days have now become the great equalizer for anyone to be able to build oh, something great. Big companies, small companies. I mean, we're using, yeah. you know, obviously, you know, Katia is being used by Ford. We're using software packages and, and, and hardware that, that were unobtainium 30 years ago. Yeah. You know, you would have to be Boeing, you know. Yep. Yeah, it, it has definitely changed for sure. Yeah, it is. It's a lot of fun, too. Yeah. So, um, I'm looking at some of the questions. It doesn't look like we've we've had too many that really sort of pertain to this discussion. Uh, we've had some people ask SolidWorks stuff. Um, please go ahead and check out SolidWorks Live for those types of things. So, um, I guess Dave, from from your perspective, like, what what do you see the landscape being? Not just for Factory Five, but just manufacturing in general. You know, we've talked a little bit about getting parts and supply chain, but like. If you look at an, at the you know here in the U.S. because we're both in the U.S., what is a, what do you think the biggest challenge we have is for manufacturing in the next ten to fifteen years? That's a great question. But before that, you know, Jesper and Jim, both mechanical engineers, both SolidWorks high end users, um, they will be at SolidWorks World and they can answer questions on the car, and that'll be kind of fun because here's the car in front of you, and yeah. they can answer questions about exactly which which sections, which modules, which you know. Whereas I'm not a SolidWorks World user, I'm a user. I'm I'm an AutoCAD guy from version release two in 1987. Um, pretty humble beginnings, um, but yeah. So those guys will be available at SolidWorks uh, SolidWorks to answer kind of those questions, and people can also email Factory Five and and ask the engineers direct questions about specific applications or designs that they're using, or the way in which okay. we're integrating, you know, SolidWorks into into our work. Uh, on our chassis and fixtures, but in terms of manufacturing in the U.S., it's it's really it's really challenging because you know I think the the you know I think I read a really fantastic book um, and it said the global code is four one one and one billion people in the Americas, one billion people in Africa, one billion people in Europe, four billion people in Asia. Um, that formula isn't going to change, and manufacturing has shifted. Uh, a huge degree to the east, and um, and that's not going to change. When we went to get, uh, we made some steel body designs, CAD design tools, and we were looking for a stamping house. Um, you know, 30 years ago, there were over 5,000 companies in the U.S. that did metal stampings, whether it was for car parts or refrigerator parts or whatever. There's 300 today. So that shift is a is a seismic global shift, and we either embrace it and recognize it because you can't fight against it. Um, so I think that for us, uh, manufacturing is going to be for companies like ours, being able to integrate new technologies to be able to do things that, that we couldn't have done at, for a cost that could not have been made before. So I think there is some opportunities in, in, in small level manufacturing, to integrate really high end tools and be competitive on a global stage. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it's naive to think that globalization, it's already over. Uh, globalization has happened. So we have to compete on a global scale. And I think that we can't make up that, 
that labor difference without automation and without CAD and without CNC. And that's not a, a you know, a fundamentally exciting new idea. It's true. And I think every successful yeah. company is doing that and admitting that. And that's why, you know, our partnership with SodWorks, with Hewlett Packard, with some great companies out there is so important to a small company like ours, because we can take these ideas and leverage them with this technology to really compete toe to toe with companies that are much better capitalized in larger scale. Um, that being said, I think there is kind of a, a romantic, um, maybe, you know, my kids went back to college and my wife and I have a chance to kind of rekindle our relationship. You know, you, you, you did your job raising your kids and in manufacturing America, I feel like we have this chance to rekindle this love affair with manufacturing and we have a chance with, with better tools than we ever had that we could have ever dreamed of. Um, small companies and large companies, I think there's a little bit more you know, swagger to manufacturing. It used to be kind of the bastard child. It was finance and sales, right? They're the, they're the yeah. rock stars. See, either Wall Street or maybe you're a lawyer or maybe you're a doctor. But nowadays, I think that, you know, uh, a steel worker can say with a lot of pride, you know, I made that, I built that, and I designed that. And maybe the craftsmen today are using better tools. But there is, I think, I think more esprit de corps and more pride in manufacturing. So hopefully that, that momentum will continue. Um, it's, it's starting to look like it's a matter of national security, but part of it is, you know, I mean, you yeah. talk to Ford and they couldn't make F-150 pickup trucks. So they couldn't get chips. So, you know, having supply side stuff taken care of and, and maybe investing more in manufacturing in the United States is a, is a good idea. I think it's happening. And I think part of it is this, we miss that. That was what made us so great. And so with tools like what you guys sell and what's behind you, I think we can compete pretty well. And Factory Five is a testament to that. We're a small company, but we're doing a pretty good job on a, on a bigger stage. Yeah, yeah, I I couldn't agree more. You know, I, I was when I was getting on the plane yesterday, flying out here, I, I was sort of was thinking about manufacturing. You know, comes from manufacturing. And if, if you think about it, like there, all of manufacturing is an art, one way or the other. Whether it's putting the right feeds and speeds in a CNC machine or laying out, you know, fiberglass by hand, there's an art to it. And, and when everything flows together, it's no different than a symphony by Mozart or seeing the Mona Lisa. Like it, everything is creativity and building. The problem is, is we use it, we've used so long a poor lens when we look at manufacturing that we miss the beauty of everything when it comes together. And I, to me, I think the more people realize that dance that happens to make, make something come to life, I think the more people would be interested in it. But I, I like how you say that because that's true. I mean, um, I saw a great Simon Sinek seminar in the three circles of quality. One was, you know, what do you do? We build custom build yourself sports cars. You know, how do you do it? Um, obviously, we use latest technology in CAD. We use a talented staff. We use aftermarket, you know, running gear from the big three engines and drivetrains, complex systems that we couldn't engineer. Um, but the why is what you just touched on on building and. The love affair with building things, if you look at the strategic focus of Factory 5, it comes down to one word, and that's build. And, and build as in manufacturing, yeah, build as in assemble, but much more than that. Take that word build and apply it to everything we've done in 27 years. We build stories, you know, father-son project. I have a car that I built with my son. I wouldn't sell for all the money in the world. Um, we build family heirlooms. We build uh, friendships. You know, a lot of our partners and our customers have been lifelong friends because we have the shared passion of building things. So when you build a car or when you manufacture something, when you make stuff, when you build stuff, it really has a, 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 a much bigger, you know, impact than just building the thing. You build a lot more around yeah. that thing. And, and, and I think that's part key to our success. We've been really lucky, but, you know, we're in partnership with our, comp our customers. Think about it. Every Factory 5 out there, is built by someone else, not by us. What we sell is not what is represented in the marketplace. What's represented in the marketplace is a customer's efforts to build. And we're riding shotgun with a build and we're giving all the substrate parts, but we didn't build it. So, you know, our relationship doesn't end when the kit is sold. It starts when the kit is sold because the way that car is configured, how it's built, the quality, that's our representation. So I love how you're thinking about manufacturing. And I hope, I hope that the country picks up on that and continues that that momentum of falling in love with building things, you know, cause it is fun. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a pride you can't replace, right? Like I, I can go do some, 
do some stuff, watch TV, mess around on my computer. Yeah, great. But and but going out in my shop and building a hot rod, you just can't you can't even put in words what the feeling you get from that is. Now you may curse every word along the way, but when you're done, there's that <laughs> sense of accomplishment. So um, I I can't agree more with you. Uh, and the same goes as like later this week when these machines are running and we're making the parts and getting ready for world. Like I'm gonna leave here happy because we created something. It may not be perfect, but it's creative. Yeah, but that's a great point. You guys are at the you're you're bridging the gap. Okay, there's the the one zero one zero world, right? Um, yeah. And it's soulless in many ways. And then there's the hands-on fabrication build world. Um, you guys bridge the gap. So these are tools of modern craftsmen. That's all they are. So you're taking the one zero one zeros and you're able us to make better stuff. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's why I'm here. <laughs> so, yeah, that's right, man. <laughs> yeah, cool. But um, looking at the the last questions, I, I think um, if there's anything else you want to add, um, we can. Otherwise, you know, I, this discussion has been awesome. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. We love your product, and um, we feel very lucky to be, you know, whether it was the launch of the internet or the the commoditization of of CAD stuff, um, it enabled everything we're doing. And so uh, you've got a, a grateful company here, and tools of modern craftsmen is the best way to say it. But uh, we'll we'll have our car at SolidWorks World, and it will be, you know, I got in trouble in third grade drawing sports cars instead of paying attention to math. I probably would have made more money if I paid attention to math, but here I am drawing sports cars and we're going to have one that we drew out of SolidWorks World. You guys are going to be the world premiere of seeing the new Fact 5 F9 is the name of the car. Yeah, and and I can tell you from pictures, it is going to be a show-stopping car to have in the shop floor. So so with that, Dave, I cannot thank you enough uh, for joining us today and for everyone else. Please register for 3D Experience World coming up in February. Stop by, see the car, see the parts we're going to run. It is going to be really, really cool. And in January, we're going to have another 3D Experience Live talking about another piece that's going to be part of the shop floor. But just please show up and check it out because you're not going to want to miss the supercar from Factory 5.